welcome to Topper Talk, your number one Western Kentucky Athletics podcast. I'm your host, Steven Moffitt, and I'm joined by co-host Tyler Bailey. Hilltopper Nation, whether it's happening on the hill or on the road, grab those red towels, stand up and cheer, because it's up next on Topper Talk. Welcome back, and thank you for downloading and listening to another episode of the Topper Talk podcast. We are the official podcast of the Red Towel Trust Collective. As always, follow us on those social medias uh, everywhere at Topper Talk. Can't miss us. Easy to find. Uh, the sponsor of this podcast is the Fireman Moving Company. They are the official moving company of WKU Athletics. Not only can they be trusted to move all the coaches in and out of Western, but they can move you anywhere nationwide. The Fireman Moving Company is owned and operated by Firemen and is founded by WK alumni. If you're looking to move sometime soon, give them a call at 270-791-1755 and get yourself a free quote. And like I always say, I promise you uh, it will be the best decision that you make if you have moving needs. Um, they would just make your life a ton easier. Um, we've got Tyler here with me, man. We've got a long and fun and pack full of information episode to dive into. Tyler, you ready to get into it? Yeah, man, sure am. Let's uh let's recap this ass kicking that Western Kentucky gave the Conference USA tournament. Hilltopper Nation, stand up. Yeah, before we dive into um the Conference USA tournament and the domination that we had down in Huntsville, uh, let's dive into our red towel wrap up which catches us up on all the athletics we've missed since we last recorded. And let's uh, get that banger of a commercial from our sponsor, Trent Betting Company. Don't forget your headboards, pillows, and your sheets. We got everything you need for a good night's sleep. Number one on the team, check best of Bowling Green. All right, all right, all right. Hey! Twin, fool, queen and king, mattresses for anything. Come and pick it out and we can bring it to your house. Have you sleep a real good before the weekend's out? Trip Trip Betty. Trip Betty. Trip Betty. It's just like, it's just like a mattress store. Hey, hey. Every time. I'm, I'm over here dancing while that commercial's going on. But to dive into the Red Tower wrap-up, WKU Baseball beat Austin P 12-9 last Tuesday in Clarksville. Yeah, and that's a good uh, Austin P team. Um, nice to get that victory. It was on the road. And now I saw a stat uh, just before we started recording here. The first five weeks of the season, we've either split or won every series that we've been in. So a really good stat. Let's keep that winning ways going. Moving on, women's basketball lost for, uh, 59-62 to 62 in the Conference USA tourney opener to Liberty. Yeah, thanks a lot, Liberty. LU, our boys Jeremiah and the and the the fans there from Liberty, they took us out in the girls tournament. Um, lost that opening game. It was close, came down to the wire. Um, but you know, the women just couldn't get it done. Kind of been the tail of the second half of the season. Uh close, but not quite there. Softball lost two and two to one to EKU at home, and then softball beat FIU eight to zip in game one, nine to one in game two, and eleven to ten in game three for the series sweep. Yeah, those girls, you know, just having trouble scoring eight, nine, and eleven runs there. Series sweep, you know, Conference USA, um, not the opener, but okay. you know, just a really good um, series for WKU. Always good to get a sleep. Uh, just continue pouring it on. They're winning a lot of games. We need to keep that going. Uh, baseball beat Southeastern Missouri State 8-3 to in game one, then lost game two to a score of 8-7 to and won game three and the series with a 7-2 blowout victory on Sunday. Again, just continuing the, uh, you know, the stat that I mentioned earlier. They haven't lost a series in the first five weeks of the season. Uh, they've at least won or split all of those and just kept that up on that one. Moving on to tennis, they beat Dayton 4-3, four, four to three, and Sophia Blanco was named Conference USA Women's Tennis Athlete of the Week. Samantha Martinez also reached a milestone with her 50th career doubles victory. Yeah, tennis is rolling. Um, that was a close one that was in Dayton, so that was on the road. Uh, they had won, I think, their last five matches. They were all at home. So we got on the road. Uh, I think they have a couple matches coming up in Alabama. I think they go to Sanford 
and UAB. So those will be tough matchups. But, um, you know, Sophia Blanco, Tennis Athlete of the Week, and then Samantha Martinez, who is our all-time doubles uh, victory leader. I didn't mention that in the notes, but she got her 50th doubles victory. So congratulations to her and Sophia for those accolades. Moving on, track and field at the Yellow Jacket Invitational. WKU had three of the top five in the high jump. Katie Eisenbarger first, uh, Amelia Lesniak in second, and Grace Turner placed fifth. Men's high jump saw Nick Farnoff finish fourth. Uh, our throwers had a good day. Luke Stegman uh, was fourth in, in discus with a personal record of 50.10 meters. Stegman also finished sixth in the hammer throw and eighth in the shot put. Friend of the podcast, Kaysen Barton, was fifth in the hammer throw at 56.42 meters. Natanya uh, Larnes threw a personal record in the javelin at 35.27 meters. On the track, Cameron Horton was third in the 110 hurdles. Natanya Leonard, dang, I always mess her name up. Linares was fifth in the women's 100 meter hurdles and the 400 meter hurdles. Newcomer Gianna. Huerta finished sixth. In the 200-meter dash, WKU finished fourth, fifth, and sixth, led by Julian Cleaner at 21.69 seconds. Nice. Wade Balcom was 11th in the 800-meter with a personal time of 1 minute 54 seconds. Trevor Hundle also set a new personal record in the race. Aiga Basic finished third in the hammer throw at 57.44 meters. Full, full results can be found on WKUSports.com. Serenading me with the track people. Um, yeah, track and field, that's that's always a lot of information to throw on you. And I think we've mentioned it before that, um, you know, those track athletes, you know, they don't always get the shine. You know, nobody really shows up and watches them compete except for their immediate friends and family. Um, but when they're competing and, and putting personal records out there, I think the coach said we had 12 PRs at this meet. So, you know, just wanted to give a little shine to all of them. I know that was a lot of stats, a lot of times, a lot of distances, heights, um, just everything we had going on um, at that invitational. Um, just good for them. They're competing well. You know, outdoor season just started for track. So, you know, hopefully we keep that up. And, you know, those those guys are really just competing against themselves, whether they're throwing, running, jumping, whatever they're doing. They're just trying to continuously get better towards the end of the season for the Conference USA Championships. And they had a good meet. So I love to see it. Uh, Lady Topper Golf at the Spring Break Shootout. Day one, Katie Craig shot a single record round record low of 63. And in round two, Sarah Arnold shot a career low round with a 66. They're currently first and tied for second. The team is in first place headed into the last round. Uh, Pro Tops, George Fant re-signed with the Seattle Seahawks. Softball's Cheyenne Sales was the Conference USA Player of the Week, and the Red Tail Trust announced a fundraiser campaign in, in which $100,000 will be matched by donors. Join today, please, because the Red Tail Trust, I mean, that is a, a, that's a huge thing. The NIL, you know, it's the future of college sports right now. And, I mean, we don't want to be left behind. We've, we've seen good stuff on the fields, on the court. Um, and we need everyone to chip in on this. I mean, the prices are set to where everybody can do it. Uh, you got something to say, Stephen? Oh, all right. Uh, that concludes the Red Towel Wrap Up, brought to you by the Trent Bedding Company. Moff, back to you. Yeah, just um, another awesome uh, Red Towel Wrap Up. Like you said, that $100,000 match um, for all donations, all new memberships, um that's pretty impressive that's pretty awesome that we have some donors stepping up to the plate uh we're trying to get at least 334 new members at the 25 dollar level um if you do the math the math is mathing uh 334 uh times 25 times 12 is going to get you to just over a hundred thousand dollars which will be matched um by the donors that are matching that campaign so we're making a push, you know, trying to strike while the iron's hot. It's no secret right now that uh, basketball just went down to Huntsville and won us a conference championship, taking us dancing for the first time in 11 years. Uh, that is the main segment of our episode here, just to talk about that, recap that, and just all the excitement that was in Huntsville. Um, I'm going to start that off just by talking about Huntsville and the new tournament location that was. 
Um, I got to head down there Wednesday afternoon um, and was down there all week, you know, took in a lot of basketball. I'll start off by saying really the only negative from the experience, from the tournament, the arena, you know, however you want to look at this whole picture of an event, the only negative was that the arena itself was a hockey arena for its main purpose of use. There was ice under the floor. It was extremely cold um, in that arena at all times. Um, you know, the fans, we were shivering. We were bringing layers. The players, you could see them on the bench with hand warmers trying to stay warm. That's the only negative. Um, the arena itself had a lot of good amenities. It uh, was very nice. It was nicely ran. You know, I, I didn't have any problems, any rudeness with anybody that worked there. Uh, concessions were all efficient. The location of the arena was near a lot of walkable uh, restaurants, bars, coffee areas. Um, there was just nice scenery. There was nice water features just everywhere you went. It was just a great location. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And, you know, you could see as the week went along, you know, Wednesday to Thursday to Friday, um, not just the fans of our team, but the fans of every team that were continuing to play were continuing to get heavier and heavier and heavier. You know, as you advance to the next round, the next day, for us, more red just kept piling in. More red kept piling in. MTSU had a really good crowd. Obviously, an easy destination for them as well. Um, you know, we saw a lot of Liberty folks there. Got to hang out with Jeremiah, uh, with Chad, and some of their other friends. So, just really an amazing um, week in general. You know, just um, it was nice to be able to go again. It had been in Frisco for several years. Uh, we left the the curtain behind retired it, buried it, hopefully burned it, whatever, um, and just had a really nice event and a really good location um, that I'm obviously glad we won, and I look forward to just getting to go back and do that every year, you know, two and a half, three-hour drive at most with traffic. Um, WKU fans traveled well. They showed out. We were loud. Um, you know, we sounded good and looked good on TV, um, then by the time we got to that championship game on Saturday, I mean, we had that place filled up. It was amazing to see. Um, before that championship game, we had a, a send off from the team hotel, you know, had everybody lined up, had the band, had cheerleaders, had big red. Um, you were there. Several other people came into town. My friend Dakota, uh, Cody came into town, the PA announcer. Um, just really great to see that continued support and just everybody getting to come down to really just soak that in uh, because it was a long time coming. I mean, we hadn't made an NCAA tournament in 11 years, and it really just was a magical moment, and you never know how long it's going to be until the next one happens. You know, obviously, we hope it's next year. We hope this is an every year. You know, Lutz has us on the right track. He's undefeated in conference championships. Um, he, he has now been to eight consecutive NCAA tournaments. He's been to three as a head coach, another five as, as, an, as an assistant coach. So all this man does is attract winners. And he's built a team and a roster full of good young men that are really good at basketball and play their hearts out for this university. I know we talked about him a lot this year, ups and downs, wins and losses, uh, moments of good, moments of bad, inconsistency flashes of brilliance um and really that just all came together for these final three games in the conference tournament and it was just domination you know that's what it was it was just an, an amazing display of basketball in all three games dominated new mexico state dominated mtsu utep was a little tougher you know we we had them on the ropes they came back second half took a little lead and how did we react we responded by punching right back got right back in the game, pulled away, and, and won us a championship. And then, you know, you and I and, you know, a couple thousand of our closest friends went down on that court in the confetti, watched some nets get cut down. You know, a lot of pictures being taken, a lot of handshakes and hugs and high fives and just memories and, and, and pictures and just everything that you can't take away from us. Just things we'll be talking about 10, 15, 20 years from now, just like we were, are – and have been, you know, the Ray Harper days and the Ty Rogers days 
and just, you know, the Dennis Felton days, um, just all the times we've made those special magical tourney runs, you know, you'll never forget it. And I'm, I'm glad we were both there, got to take that in together, um, had a lot of friends with us. Um, can't beat it, man. I had a great time. We're going to dive into the games. We're not going to, you know, rake over them and, and dive into them as deep as we usually do. We're just going to surface level, talk about our domination. But before we do that, Tyler, tell us about, you know, your experience. You did come down um, and get to take in, you know, the send off, the final game, the celebration afterwards. You know, what was your experience like down in Huntsville? This was my first ever conference uh, championship that I got to go to. And, uh, you know, me and Jefferson, we, we drove down. We uh, were kind of late to the send off, but we made it there for the team, walked out of the hotel. Uh, I mean, it was it was awesome seeing, you know, so much so much red down there in front of that Marriott. Um, and I just had a good feeling. You know, the coach, uh, Lutz, he challenged the fans. He said, uh, you know, it's an easy drive, which it really is. Uh, especially once you get off I-65, it is a straight shot. I mean, that road don't turn a bit. Um, and it, it was it was good being down there surrounded by uh, so many people. We saw a former player down there, uh, a, a, a very tall man. Um, he was down there, you know, supporting the tops. And <clears throat> driving to the arena, very simple. Roads were practic practically empty. Um and it looked like a beautiful downtown area. Like next year, I hope to get a few days off to where I can go down there earlier. Um, and you're right, the fan, the the support staff who was working the the arena, nicest people in the world. From the people working the um, parking structure, uh, I had a few questions like, "How do I get to the arena?" They easily pointed me, uh, talked to me nicely. It was it was cool. And then whenever you got in there, you know, we had to wait for them Blue Raider fans to get out of the seats. And so many people was rushing to get down to fill them seats uh, down in the lower section. But once you got down there, I mean, you just look around and that lower bowl was just full of red. I mean, it kind of it really felt like a home game for us. And, you know, um, I saw some on YouTube or I'm sorry, on X, Twitter. Um, I think it was a UTEP fan. They were complaining about having to drive so far. Well, now you know how we feel whenever it was in Frisco. Um, so I'm glad it moved away from there. But, I mean, sitting there so close to the team that you saw the coaches' reactions, you saw the support staff's reaction. Um, John Irwin, I, I think one time he turned around, he was – I think he looked at Hank and was like, my blood pressure's so high right now. I mean, he was pumped, and it was cool seeing the players, you know, getting into it, trying to trying to get the fans riled up, which didn't take much because, you know, I think you can agree that the fans, especially where we were sitting, was was ready to explode at any time. Uh, we were always loud. We were cheering, uh, doing chants. Um, I mean, it was just a – it was something I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. And then once we won, you're right, we, we jumped a little wall, got there on the court, and that court, it was sticky, man. I mean, I don't know how them UTEP players were walking so much whenever they would fall down and slide across the floor. Uh, I went out there and kicked it a few times, you know. And, uh, I mean, it it was it was tacky. Uh, it, it felt kind of cool. But, uh, yeah, we got to see the coach cut down the net, see all the players cut down the net, see the trophy presentation. I mean, it, it, was, it was an amazing thing to be at. And, uh, I hope next year we do it again. I hope a lot more Hilltopper fans come down there with us because, I mean, it is so close that it, it could be considered a home game, especially whenever the Hilltopper faithful get down in there and get loud and cheer on them tops. But, I mean, it, it was a great thing, a, a great experience, and you're right, something I will never forget for the rest of my life. Yeah, and this, this uh, tournament set up kind of perfectly for us. You know, we come in as the number three seed, uh, Sam Houston and La Tech were the one and two seeds. Uh, the first night I get there, Louisiana Tech, Wednesday night, playing Middle Tennessee, they get knocked off. You know, we have, we have to win. We have to beat New Mexico State, and that sets up that 100 miles of hate. Uh, second round matchup. Uh, before that, we had to play New Mexico State, um, beat them by 20. Just absolutely blew them out. Um, was never close. Sorry, Jordan Rawls. Sorry, buddy. Um, you know, 
just knocked them off rather easily. Rodney Howard had the best game of his season, 20 points, five rebounds. Um, after the game, I'm sure everybody's seen his highlights of his interview on the court side, and he gave a shout-out to the fans. He said, what about these fans? And, this, you know, that was the Thursday night game. We showed up. We showed out even Thursday night. We were there. We were loud. We were proud. Um, and then Sam Houston, the number one seed, got knocked off by UTEP. So number one and number two seeds get knocked off uh, before the semifinals. And, um, you know, just opens the door, you know, the perfect storm scenario where, you know, two teams we struggled with, you know, Sam Houston beat us twice. We split with Law Tech and they're just a tough matchup for us. Um, we're gone. We're out of the tournament. You know, it was, it was ours to lose at that point, but we had the middle Tennessee state matchup, uh, the rematch, you know, the third time's the charm, you know, especially after the way we lost to them in Murfreesboro just a couple weeks before uh, that controversial, controversial, you know, not timeout, jump ball, whatever you want to call it, you know, just a bad call, left a bad taste in our mouth. So what do we do? We put a 30 piece on them, beat them 85 to 54, uh, our hundredth victory in the hundred miles of hate, um, just absolute domination the whole the whole way. You know, I think they had one player that scored in double figures. I think that was Justin Porter. I think he hit 14 points or so. No one else in double figures. Um, you know, just like the New Mexico State was probably some of the best basketball we had played for 40 minutes. Some of the best defense. You know, I think defensively. The, the efficiency rating of that game, that was our best defensive game of this season. Held them to 54 points, which surprisingly wasn't their lowest point total of the season. But, um, you know, being about 31, I'll take it. You know, I'm not mad at it. Uh, Don McHenry came back alive. He'd been quite, kind of quiet the last few weeks of the season. He had 18 points. Christian Lander had 15 points and four rebounds. Brandon Newman had 15 points. And then we advanced to the championship game against UTEP, um, you know, it, it was a lot more physical, um, a lot more closer of a game than what the other two were. You know, we jumped out to a big lead early. Um, they were able to cl climb and, and fight and get back into it. Um, early in the second half, they took a lead. I think they went up by as much as six. Uh, Zid Powell, you know, knocked down a couple threes, stretched that lead out. Um, we didn't expect him to be a shooter, but he was our leading scorer. I think he had 22 points in the game, but, uh, the defense finally locked down. We got about to that under 12, the defense locked down, started getting stops. Uh, Don McHenry came alive, 25 points, five rebounds in this game. Brandon Newman had 15 points. Christian Lander had 11 points and six rebounds. Um, ended up pulling this game away, ended up winning 78-71. The confetti fell. Uh, the team celebrated. You know, I posted that picture. I put it on Instagram and Twitter. I think that you know my favorite picture of the entire weekend was going down to that final horn of the final game, and the entire bench was locked, arms to shoulders, just watching this this clock tick down before it was official that they had won the championship, and just witnessing that brotherhood, that family that playing and that passion they had for each other, man. It was just something, you know, like you said, I'll never forget it. It was not going away from my memory, man. It was amazing. Uh, Don McHenry was named the tournament MVP. Uh, and Don, Rodney, and Brandon Newman all made the all-tournament team. Um, just an amazing, amazing, amazing tournament. Uh, before we jump into grades, I, I do want to get your, your feelings, your um, feedback from these games. Did anything stand out or any one stand out from you in all three of these games? Well, one thing that stood out to me is, you know, when Stansbury was the coach last few, uh, whenever, during his tenure, uh, and before conference championship would always come around, I'd always get nervous. Uh, and then, you know, whenever we get to the final, I, I, I had, I had always had a bad feel, feeling about it. Um, this year, I really didn't. I mean, I may have been just a, a tad bit nervous when we played New Mexico State, knowing how we had, you know, come in on a four-game losing streak. Uh, I didn't know how the team was going to respond. Um, but after we beat them by 20 points, and I was like 100 miles away, you know, MTSU, that's going to be nothing. Um, and then by the time we got Saturday, I was like, hell, with the way this team's playing, I mean, <laughs> 
I don't think we're going to lose it. So I wasn't nervous. Um, I mean, Howard, you're right. He played the best game of his career against New Mexico State. I mean, it was awesome to be able to um, w- listen to, because that game was on ESPN Plus, I had to listen to that one. But it was awesome listening to Hal and Randy call that game. Um, McHenry, you know, he came back 18 uh, points and 25 points versus uh, MTSU and UTEP, respectively. I mean, M- McHenry came in, and um, whenever he started scoring, I was like, "This, is, this, this game's over. This is going to be his. This is going to be his game." I, I didn't think our defense was going to shut down MTSU um, like they did. And I mean, our three-point shooting, fifty-five percent, I believe, for the game uh, versus MTSU. Uh, now against UTEP, I was a little bit worried because we were like three for fifteen from from be, behind the arc, and. Um, you know, we, we just kept that lead up. And then we, whenever we did give it up, we would either get to the free throw line or we would make stops and end up, you know, getting, you know, two pointers. So, or, and ones. I mean, it was just a great tournament. Um, I mean, <laughs> I guess what stood out to me was like, these guys really did play for each other. Like they, there was no quit in them. And uh, that's just something good to see. I mean, Faye, Bob Carr had 10, 10 rebounds in the game against UTEP. Moore had 10 against uh, MTSU. I mean, just people you didn't think – I'm not going to say that you, you didn't think would put up points because they're all adding to and they're all facilitators. But, I mean, Jack, uh, Jack against New Mexico State, he had four assists. I mean, I and I think he was 0 for 2 in that game. I mean, Jack's kind of been quiet, kind of like the quiet assassin. He ain't scored much all season, but whenever he's in there, you know he's going to get the pass to the right guy at the right moment. Um, you know, he's he, he's steady, and, I mean, whenever they give the ball to him, they, they like to run. He likes to run, uh, run and go fast. So, I mean – this team is this, this is probably one of my favorite teams that I've seen in in, in a while. You know, I ain't gonna take nothing away from um, uh, Josh Anderson or Justin Johnson, but sorry, I just heard. <laughs> I thought that door was opening up. <laughs> kind of creepy, uh, but no, I mean this 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 right here is just a great run through the Conference USA tournament. Uh, I mean, this team, this team played their ass off, and, and I'm so proud of them. Yeah, and a couple just other observations before we jump into some grades for this tournament championship. Um, one stat I found interesting that a coach pointed out afterwards was, you know, of all the people we named and points and scores and impact players, the player that played the most minutes in this tournament for Western Kentucky was Enoch Kalambe. Now, maybe the stat sheet wasn't stuffed. You know, he did have a couple good games of rebounds. I think he had a six-piece and a seven-piece uh, in those games. But scoring-wise, you know, not putting up a ton. But he was just kind of that glue guy, does a little bit of everything, the intangibles, the defense, toughness. Um, you know, played the most minutes for us. That's an impressive stat. You know, we've got a lot of good players on this team. Um, he's not a starter. He comes off the bench, but he's playing starter minutes. Um, and he put it together and helped us win these games. Another one I have to highlight is Jack. You talked about Jack Edlin, um, you know, his leadership of the offense when he comes in for Dawn. Um, it's not really a change of pace, but it's a change of, you know, focus of that leader. You know, when Dawn's in, he, he's looking to facilitate, but he's looking to score. He is a scorer by heart. Jack comes in and he is a facilitator. He's looking to pass the ball. And then I have to talk about his defense versus MTSU. When he came in, he was matched up with Justin Porter, who had a 41-point game just a few weeks ago. Um, He may not have led the league in scoring in points per game, but I would be hard-pressed to find and name a better scorer in this league than Justin Porter. Can can get to the rim, mid-range, can shoot to three. Probably one of the best scorers in Conference USA. And Jack locked him down. I mean, absolutely amazing effort. 
from a walk-on player. You know, he is a walk-on player and out there busting his butt, stepping up to any challenge, um, and just playing his heart out, man. You know, and definitely gave him uh, his props after that game, you know, directly to his face. I want him to know, like, man, you are inspiring with the way you play. It's amazing. I love to watch it. I can't wait to watch it for three more years, man. He's impressive. Tegan came in, gave us good minutes. Uh, Christian was was good all week. Um, you know, we talked about Brandon, Rodney, Baba, just everybody. Everybody came to play and added something to this tournament run. There was nobody hindering. Um, you know, we know Dante got hurt that next to last game against MT. He had a spill. Um you know, we were worried he wasn't going to play or be available versus UTEP. He was on the bench. He was dressed. He ultimately didn't play in that championship game. He was available, I think, out of caution um, and necessity. They didn't put him in the game. Um, but we hope he heals up and he's ready for the NCAA tournament. You know, that's what, you know, playing at this level is all about. You want to get to that tournament and just make some noise. And I think Dante, you know, the games when he was playing, he was he was in knocking some shots down. Um, and we're going to need that, you know, if we want to pull an upset going forward uh, with our matchup with Marquette, you know, we're going to need some shots to be made, and he can come in and do that. He's shown that. Um, so just a great tournament, great experience. And we're going to jump into some grades. These aren't going to be individual game grades. This is just going to be for the, the tournament as a whole. I think we can safely lump these grades into just a three-game package of grades. So first, let's start with the offense. What you got for them? Well, we got above our average in all but one game, and we were knocking on the door in that one. Um, I mean, we played we played like our hair was on fire. And, uh, I mean, I'm going to give the offense an A-plus on this. I mean, I don't think there's anything else you can give them. Yeah, the, the offense was an easy A. All three games didn't let up. Best games of the season, for sure, an A. What about the defense? Also going to be an A-plus. I mean – uh, we limited MTSU to 54, uh, and I looked it up in their lowest, I believe, from what I saw, just scanned it real quick, was 34, and I was against St. Mary's. They probably had another 40-point game somewhere because they're trash. But uh, we held them to 54, so I'm going to give – and New Mexico State 69, I'm going to give them – and, uh, I mean, we got a shit ton of blocks in this in this tournament, I feel like. Um, I mean, our defense was on point, so, yeah, and I'm going to give an A-plus. Yeah, A-plus, easy. No doubt, no question. Easy A. What about the coaching? Oh, that coaching. That was some that, that's some good coaching. And, you know, it's crazy that Lutz is undefeated in uh in conference tournaments. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously he knows what he's doing from all them pit stops that he's had, uh, as assistant coach, as a head coach. Uh, I mean, he's learned something from everywhere. So I'm gonna give him and uh coach uh uh Plano and all of them, I'm gonna give them an A plus. Yeah, again, an easy A. Uh, these coaches came out with in every game with a focused game plan and execution for the team, um, and they just did it. You know, never hung their heads, even when they got behind in the championship game, um, and just, quite frankly, dominated this tournament. Throwing you a curveball, adding one in here, not going to fans next. What about a grade for the Huntsville location? It's, it has to be better than Birmingham. Way, way better than Frisco. I mean, I'm probably going to give it an A2. It, you know, it's so easy to get to. And for some reason, whatever it was on Saturday, the roads that I saw were pretty much empty, especially downtown. I mean, it was a quick – I did have to go around that big-ass park. Uh, it was a beautiful park, by the way. Uh, I hope next year to be able to go around there and walk. Um, I'm going to give that that an A as well. Yeah, Huntsville gets an A. You know, when it was first announced, I was a little bit skeptical about the location. I, 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 I'm from Alabama myself. I was born there, but I haven't spent a ton of time in the various areas. And But when I got there, uh, met up with our friend Jeremiah, like I said earlier, we did quite a bit of walking. We uh, went to downtown, uh, went to Condado Tacos, just did a lot, you know, went to a coffee shop went to breakfast, just went to a lot of different places in town. Um, and I was just really impressed by everything. A lot of new buildings, a lot of development still going on. 
um, it was a great city. It was a great location. And I'm glad and proud that it's going to be there for a couple more years at least. And hopefully for the you know foreseeable future, selfishly as a fan base, that's it's about as close as you can be for an easy drive. Um, so yeah, Huntsville gets an A for me, 1000%. Now, what about the fan grade in Huntsville? You know, even on the radio, uh, I could still hear the fans cheering on Thursday night. Um, you know, I could hear all their de- TOPS, 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 tops. I could hear them cheering. Um, uh, and then on Friday, I saw them on TV and then Saturday to be in the, in the midst, in the midst of the, uh, of the, all the big red fans, uh, to me, uh, they answered the coach challenge. I mean, it, even up top, wherever on both sides, it was pretty much red whenever the, wherever the people were seeing, there were a the few UTEP fans that know there aren't to our far left, but they were really quiet the entire game. Uh, I'm going to give our fans an A plus as well. Yeah. 1000%. The fans showed up and showed out and were loud for every single game. We were, we were well represented, um, you know, as, as one of the nine schools there, you know, the only one that was even close to us um, was the MTSU women's crowd. They did have a good crowd that showed up for um, their Saturday and their Sunday or the Friday and the Saturday championship game. They had a good crowd of blue, um, but unfortunately their men's supporters got sent home early uh, with that 31 piece spanking that we gave them. So, you know, the fans, um, again, loud, got better every single day. Um, and I have no doubt that in the future, you know, next year, I think we're going to see that number get even better. Um, just a lot of excitement. I think there's going to be a lot of positive reviews of the area. It's an easy drive. You know, go ahead and make plans now. I'm already, I'm clear my calendar. I'm ready. You know, I'm coming back next year without a doubt. Uh, I know I'm going to see a lot of friends down there, you know, meet with, meet up with some, you know, some conference mate, uh, pals, rivals, whatever you want to call them, you know, have a good time and watch a whole lot of basketball, man. It was a fun trip um, and can't wait to do it again. Now, obviously we won this tournament and got the automatic bid for conference USA. Um, We saw the selection show Sunday, um, the did arena watch show, we got that 15 seed uh, that we were penciled in by Joe Lenardi leading up to that against Marquette, the number two seed. Um, the game will be on Friday at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. It's in Indianapolis at the Gainbridge Fieldhouse. Um, Marquette opened up as a 16.5 point favorite with the game having an over under of 158.5. Marquette finished the season 25 and nine on the year. They were 10 and 6 in Big East play. They finished second in the Big East to UConn, and they also lost to UConn in the Big East tournament championship game. They're coached by Shaka Smart, and they returned 87% of their production from last season's team. Uh, they finished the season ranked number eight in the top 25. And to get a little bit more insight about this team and what to expect, I sat down with Charlie from the Tapping the Keg Sports podcast. So let's check out that interview right now. All right, and I've got Charlie here joining me from the Tapping the Keg Sports uh, Marquette podcast. So, Charlie, welcome to the podcast. Appreciate you joining me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Really, uh, really excited to uh, talk about Marquette hoops and uh, where where everything's going with the matchup and what they what they've done so far this season. Absolutely. Now, before we jump into the teams and the matchup and just kind of what to expect you know, in Indianapolis on Friday, I guess, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, just your background, who you are, how this podcast got started and just your, your, your fanhood with Marquette in general. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so honestly it started, I, I started blogging like my senior year of, of high school. Uh, it, actually I put out a random rumor about John Calipari and cheating in Kentucky had a lot of people on a blog spot that were not happy with me years ago years and years and years ago but uh i then got into podcasting i want i was a broadcast journalism i actually never used it but i loved the idea of radio and started doing it with some friends then i got into doing more daily podcasts which i still do uh for the most part we do four days a week now apple and spotify it's happening to keg sports and 
we talk about Marquette a lot, but we also talk about other Wisconsin sports. And it's been a incredible run with the Milwaukee Bucks championship, a lot of Green Bay Packer heartbreak. Um, and then the Brewers have been pretty successful as well. So if you're a fan of one of those teams, as, a, as well as a Western Kentucky fan, and there's a hybrid crossover. Sorry, I muted myself there. Feel free to check us out. And uh, we'll definitely uh, definitely look forward to that. But yeah, that's how it started. And my Marquette fan of my dad went to undergrad and law there. And so I grew up watching Marquette. I grew up getting into it. I was one of the few, I think my fandom do really grew when I was in high school. That was when Dwayne Wade, you know, got going and Travis and Travis Diener and Steve Novak and all these guys who became NBA players. They were kind of core part of that, but also the Marquette Wisconsin rivalry ran really deep in the Southeastern part of Wisconsin. It's only where it matters. And because of that, it was, fiercely intense during my high school years. And I think that added to my Marquette fandom. And then when I went to college, you know, like four hours away, everyone's like, Oh, this, it doesn't matter. We like both teams. And I'm like, what? Like how? So, but I, I still talk a little bit about the Badgers on the podcast, but not, not to anywhere near uh, with Marquette and excited to excited for this matchup and excited to talk more about uh, what the golden Eagles have done this season. I've got to touch on the uh, the Calipari rumors of cheating that you mentioned. Yeah. I don't think that was a rumor. Probably happening. I mean, I think we all know his track record, <laughs> UMass, Memphis, and now UK. Um, it's just a shame they can't win any big basketball games no, anymore. No, and uh, Marquette, Marquette has had a really good run rate in terms of beating Kentucky in the NCAA. We've faced them like six or seven times. Could happen this year in Dallas. Um, it's something they're, they are a – a custom of doing, and I've read sort of that the matchup would be a nightmare if uh, Kentucky did did get there and Marquette got there. So I, I do, if, you know, I think it's going to be a tough matchup, uh, you know, round one, and I think round two, I think every matchup really is tough, and there's no tailor-made run. Like, we can all say UConn's going to repeat, but I see there are problem spots in that, and so you just never know. That's what makes it great. That's why this is you know, one of the best times of the year is, as everyone says, it's, it's not a cliche. Yeah. It's the best time of the year. Now I know, you know, I'm not the only Hilltopper fan that as soon as, uh, you know, selection Sunday, five thirty hit and we saw that bid come on the screen. It was us and, and Marquette. The first thing we did is we went to ESPN. We went, so let's go look at this resume. Um, obviously you are two seed, you are a clear favorite, you know, opened up as 15 and a half point favorite that's moved since then. Uh, the team went 25 and nine on the year. I think you were 14 and six in conference, uh, finished second in the big East and finished runner up to UConn in the big East tournament. So obviously, you know, top 10 team has been really good just all year. Um, this is def this is your third year under head coach Shaka smart. And I know that name is, uh, just familiar in college basketball circles, you know, his style of play, what he brings to the table. He's been very successful, especially tournament runs in the past. So, you know, how has his tenure now uh, translated and fit in at Marquette? Yeah, I, everyone loves Shaka. Shaka has rebuilt the Marquette energy. Marquette had a huge fan base and it kind of waned during the Steve Wojciechowski era uh, who came in and he kind of tried to run it like Duke. It's very similar to when Bill Belichick assistants take over in the NFL and they basically are like, oh, we're going to just do a New England here in Houston or in uh, o Oakland or whatever it may be. And then it just doesn't happen. And that kind of happened with Wojo and players didn't want to tell. They didn't want to come back. Alumni did not want to be part of the Marquette. And now they infuse the alumni every game. It's like, welcome back. So, and it can be just a random player. It's not just like Jay Crowder or Dwayne Wade or Novak. It can be just like a guy off the bench in one of their teams. And it's like, they really build that. And he's so big on relationships. Uh, he has this thing called EGBs, which are ener energy gathering behaviors um, and just has this real spirit and everyone wants to ride with him. And I think that there is an admiration with him. That being said, if they don't get to the second weekend with this group of guys bringing back 87% of your roster, no one went into the transfer portal and you don't get to the second weekend, it is going to be seen as a massive disappointment. We've all 
been waiting for this. This is the revenge tour and it, it kind of now needs to happen uh, because the, this year was great. They, they had some downtime, but it was, it was a pretty, it met expectations. It was fine. UConn was a wagon. That's okay. But it was, there were some downs, but for the most part, it was a really fun year. And I think we also would have thought it, the final stretch of games, because they were really peaking that they could have had a shot against UConn and Creighton down the stretch in those games. Tyler Cole looks healthy, but he unfortunately had the injury. He's going to be back on Friday, according to everything we've seen and read. But it's it's definitely there. But if they don't do at least something in March, I think there's going to be some questions about Shaka, even with all the good vibes and the spirit that he's brought back with the, the university and this basketball program. Yeah, you kind of touched on my next question. and I didn't realize you were returning 87% of the scoring on your roster from last year. That's huge, you know, especially when, you know, I look at our roster and we have nine new faces on the team. So it's just a lot of continuity. So I have to ask, you You said expectations were met, but what, you know, what would you say your expectations were heading into this basketball season? And then they were met, but, you know, just how did that pan out, you know, looking at it from a helicopter view now that the, you know, the regular season's over? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think they got even higher when in Maui we go in there, close win against UCLA. We beat Kansas from start to finish. That was a wire to wire victory. Kansas, number one at the time, Hunter Dickinson, Kevin McCuller, bringing back everybody, and they dominate them. They lose to Purdue by three. We were on the tail end of watching Zach Eady be a foul merchant. And then and it's just, I, I have no idea how he's going to get wrapped in. And Klingon's the same way at UConn. But, and then you lose to Wisconsin, who that's one thing Shaka has not been able to do is figure out how to beat Wisconsin, which really gets under a lot of Marquette fans' skin. And they had some trouble winning on the road. Kolek kind of got in his own head about playing on the road. He he is a very, he's like, you love to have him on your team. You hate him if he's not on your team. And a lot of Big East fans made jokes that he couldn't read and would chirp him on Twitter and things like that. And so he, he, and he would play along with it. He was ready and right into it, but it got a little bit too much and then they got hot. And so, yeah, there was a lot of, and there's been a lot of good development. David Joplin is much better than the player he was earlier this season. Uh, ben Gold has started to make strides. He was, he's still a little soft, but he was way softer to start the year. The freshmen, uh, Trey Norman and Zade Lowry, are vital are nice guys off the bench. They were at times unplayable and Chase Ross has stepped up. So they've really grown this roster as the year has gone on. And so I think that part you are next year was going to be, Oh, it's going to be a step back because of Kolek and Aguidaro. It's now going to be more of a, Hey, they still have, they still have something here and maybe they're not going to be a two seed, but they could certainly be a five to eight seed next year without, without question. Yeah, you mentioned Kolek there, and I know you know that's a name that, as Hilltopper fans are looking and doing some stat exploration, and just trying to get to know your market team and who to watch out for. You know, it jumps out when you got a guy averaging seven plus assists a game, and he's obviously a guy that, you know, like I call Dominic Henry on our side, he's the straw that stirs the drink. You know, that guy obviously is impactful um, and has been dealing with some injuries. So. I, you know, you said he should be back. Um, do you think he's 100% or how do you think that injury could affect this matchup? I, I think he should be 100%. I think the speed of this matchup could be an issue with an oblique injury where it's up and down and you're twisting, turning, and it's not this slow pace, low possession basketball game that hopefully his conditioning's up. I think that would also be a worry. I think Marquette strategically held him out this week in the Big East tournament, I don't have that sourced. I just, that's how I feel because they knew that they were probably locked into the two seed. And then when you see Tennessee go down, when you see Arizona go down, um, it was even more of a given. And they're like, and I think it built the confidence of the other guys to say, hey, we can win. We don't need Tyler to be that straw straw surgery, which you're absolutely right. He is, but they, they kind of needed to learn how to win without him a little bit too. And so now they've kind of done that. And so I think he should be up to full. The only thing that might limit him is that conditioning. And maybe he's not ready for that up and down fast pace. So maybe market takes the air out of the ball a little more than what they're known for, just because of Kolek's injury to just make sure he's, you know, a hundred percent, but 
you're I think you'll be fascinated not fascinated probably wrong word but like just the way he passes the basketball is something I just I've never never seen before the pass he made if against St. John's at home National Marquette Day which is like their homecoming for football it was one of the best passes I have no idea you probably find it on YouTube I have no idea how he made the pass and it's just incredible and him and Oso Aguidara have as special of a pick and roll relationship as anybody in college basketball and Bucks fans joked like Damian Lillard and Giannis need to like watch that and just understand it. It's like that good. And they can, they can go to work uh, if they need to. And that's, that's always there for them. Yeah. I'm going to appreciate good basketball. Even if we're on the losing end of it, I can't wait for this matchup. You mentioned the, uh, the pace and the tempo of this game. Uh, you know, Marquette, you all entered this game as the number 59 scoring offense in the nation. You're at 78.3. Western Kentucky's right around 80. We're, you know, very, you know, kind of lumped in there in that same uh, about a, the amount of points per game. This game, you know, the over-under is 158.5. You know, this, like you mentioned on, you know, your segment that we did for your podcast, like this is going to be a game that's going to be fun to watch. It's going to be up and down. It's going to be fast. It's going to be a lot of scoring. Um, hopefully not a lot of turnovers on our end, but, you know, it's it's very liable to happen with just the style that both of these teams play on both sides of the ball. Um, you know, who would you say are, are two or three of the offensive players that the Western Kentucky fans need to be aware of and know that we're going to have to focus on these guys and defensively and shut them down if we want to have any opportunity of pulling out this upset? Yeah, I, I think David Joplin is one to watch. He is a guy that is a flamethrower. He can get hot, and if he gets hot early, it's like, look out. Just give him the ball, clear out, let Tim just keep shooting. He is a catch-and-shoot assassin. He's been getting better off the dribble. Cam Jones is the same way. He is Mr. Tough, Tough Shot Express. You'll wonder how the hell that shot went in because he's he contorts his body in all sorts of different ways. Um, and he's the same sort of that flamethrower. This guy isn't exactly an offensive, like heat check kind of guy, but Stevie Mitchell is, I w- he is the definition of like a glue guy, but he's more than a glue guy. He's like a super glue guy is what we've been calling him on some of the things we do because he just is always there, right place, right time. Somehow the, the ball goes to him. He's a magnet to the ball. Some felt like he could have won defensive player of the year. I would expect him to be on Don McHenry and he'll pick that matchup. And that will likely be where Mitchell's assignment is. Um, and he can be, he can be a real bulldog out on the perimeter, but it's a, he does it on offense too now, which has been a development and a growth for, for Stevie. You know, you mentioned Joplin and being a flamethrower. Um, I saw that as I'm picking through stats and going through box scores and just some games. I, I know I'll pick certain wins, certain losses just to see who's kind of leading the charge. And, one thing that stood out to me was Joplin was 0 for 6 versus UConn in your last game. And that yep. concerns me because I feel like, okay, he got out of his system. Now he's about to he's about to have a 7 for 10 game coming this Friday. I, I hope not. Yeah. Um, but three-point defense at times has been worrisome for us and has caused us to lose some games. So we're going to need to keep that in check and be very aware of that. So, yeah, thank, thanks for sharing that. Oh, that yeah. Tidbit. No doubt. Yeah, they they can shoot it. They can get going. And if they get like Kolik, Kolik is not a three point shooter, or was never a three. But he's gotten a lot better. So it'll be interesting to see if that's something he tries early on or if he's just trying to be a facilitator, get comfortable in the game. You know, there was a game against the Paul and the Paul is one of the worst teams in all of college basketball. But he only scored three points in the game, but he set the Marquette record for assists. And was just like, I'm going to break the assist record tonight. <laughs> and he did. And that's kind of the guy Tyler Cole can be. He just, he kind of decides, all right, how do I want to dictate this basketball game? And sometimes it's just feeding Stevie, Jop, and and Cam for threes. Or it's him actually being, you know, the offensive uh, facilitator. Yeah. And then uh, on the other side of the ball, you know, just looking at your defense and kind of, trying to figure out what to expect from uh, this Marquette team. And I think as soon as anybody hears Shaka Smart, you know, like I mentioned on, on your podcast, like just thinking about what you historically know Shaka for is always an intense defensive effort. Like it's not going to be something that you're just going to bring the ball up the court with no pressure and set up your offense. Like it's probably going to be just 94 feet of havoc. Uh, you all were number 102 in the nation in scoring defense, allowing 69.7 points per game. 
Uh, you were number 26 in turnovers fourth per game at 14.71 and number six in the nation in turnover margin. I think it was like plus 4.71, something just really high, really good, and obviously putting yourself and your team in a better position to win this game. So, um, you know, what is it about this Shaka Smart system and the defense that makes them so effective? And who, you know, defensively, is there any certain person that's kind of leading that charge that WKU needs to be aware of? Yeah, I, I think really it's just making sure that everybody's accounted for. There's not, there's no obvious defensive mistakes. They play a little more of a drop style defense. They allow a lot of three pointers um, and they just bet on the variance. They bet that teams aren't going to make as many threes as they're going to give up. Um, and they're okay with it. Uh, Osa Gadar is great down below. He gives big guys fits. He can, He's just a good defender. He's gotten better at not exactly following. And Stevie Mitchell on the outside, who I mentioned, is, you know, some thought he could have been defensive player of the year uh, for the Big East. Uh, he wasn't. It went to Ryan Kalkbrenner, uh, which is another controversy for another time. And then uh, really the other guy, Zaid Lowry off the bench, he's playing more minutes. He's a freshman. His shot isn't there but he can be a real pain on, on defense. And if you put Zane and Stevie out there with Kolek facilitating to do kind of both, I, that's usually, it's usually a good combination. And that's the other thing too, is Kolek and Jones have gotten better defensively. They weren't as good last year. Marquette's defense wasn't, you know, where it is this year and they've improved. And I think it's just the continuity of this team. The fact that so many of these guys are back, they've, They've really figured out how to play with each other, and they're extremely well connected on that side of the ball. Now, this next question, I'm not looking for insider information. I'm not. That's expect, okay. I'm not expecting you to show your cards. Um, as far as I'm aware, I don't think coaches and players listen to this podcast. So you, this is a safe <laughs> space. Just let's get that out in the open. You know what? What would you say that WKU has to do? to have any chance of pulling off this upset, you know, a 15 versus a two is unlikely, but what do we have to do if we want to get this win? I, I think you, you can't turn the ball over. I think that's number one. And if you, you keep the turnovers low Marquette forces, a lot of turnovers, as you mentioned, and they get a lot of points off those turnovers. I think it's also, you know, kind of beating up Tyler Kolick a little bit. Now, granted, if the refs call it tight, you might not be able to do that, but some of the teams that Tyler Kolek has struggled against have been the more physical teams in the Big East. Like if you look at his stat line against Seton Hall, if you look at the first game against UConn, they kind of we like to say it because you know the Bucks and Heat have a rivalry. You know, in the NBA, it's kind of the Miami Heat style of defense where they just follow you all the time and you hope that you don't have a tight whistle and that they're not going to call everything, that you're betting that they're not going to call everything. So I think if you get really physical, that can help. And then the last part is offensive rebounds. If, if you're pulling down at extra second chance opportunities, that has really put Marquette in deficits. So St. John's, you mentioned that game earlier, they were down 15 in the first half. It's this big game, and it was all because St. John's kept getting second chance points. And then Marquette kind of tightened it up in the second half and made the adjustments and were able to, literally flip that game they won by double digits but that's that was a that was the whole reason was second chance points did you hear that coaches no, i'm kidding <laughs> no, it's, all right. it's okay i don't think any of those are secrets i mean i mean that's why some are worried about us if they were to advance that florida florida and colorado both present a little bit of a problem uh if if that were to be the matchup, if they are to win on Friday. And yeah. I think that that's, that's definitely there. So it's, I don't think any of it's a secret, but it, yeah, the, maybe the beating up the Tyler Kolek's a little, that's, yeah. that to me is a little more inside yeah. than, than the other two. No, I'm sure uh, Tim McAllister that's on the scout for this game. I'm sure he does need my insight for what to do to, you know, try to find the weak spots. Now, have a little mercy with me on this question because, you know, don't just say you got to show up in Indy and get off the bus. What what does Marquette have to do to ensure that they get this win and they keep on dancing? I think I think it really just comes down to starting a little quicker than they have. They they've done a better job of it recently, but they have every now and again kind of lulled into basketball games where it's like there might be something here. And then they they really are a good second half adjustment team. They do a great job of sort of seeing what's out there, seeing what's working, seeing what's not, and where can we exploit. 
But I think in a game like this and knowing that you've kind of put pressure on yourself by talking about, yeah, Cam Jones mentioned it after the selection show, like my blood's still boiling from last year and everything else. Like they just need to come out in that first 10 minutes and hit WKU in the mouth. And if they do that, they'll be fine. But if they let them hang around, hang around, hang around, that's when you start getting tight. And I don't, I don't want to be, you know, I, and I think I already said this, but like, I don't want to be pacing around my house four minutes left to go in this game, you know, basically running defensive possessions with them, you know, in a crouch and having to crack a beer way too early than, than I plan to on a, on a Friday. That's technically work day. Um, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll hope that hope to avoid that. All right. Humor me with the score prediction. How do you, how do you see this one playing out? I, I think, I think that spreads a little high, just given the fact I like the turnovers and Marquette then WKU giving up threes. I could see it, but I just, I think it'll be a 10 point game. I think Marquette wins, but I, I think that there'll be stuff that WKU will look at and they they'll see it as things to take away from next year. And I think it'll be, you know, somewhere in the, I'll, I'll go, 85 to 75. So I think that would that give us the over? I think that would give us the over. Um, but yeah, I think be high scoring, it'll be fun. Um, but I, I think ultimately Marquette comes comes away victorious. Yeah, I'm I'm about in that same score range. I think 85, 75, 82, 72, somewhere in that range. I think uh likely Marquette, you know, we're gonna have to stop you all making threes and we're going to have to make some ourselves to pull this uh, upset off. Now, Charlie, I, you know, I do appreciate you coming on spreading some market knowledge to us before we let you get out here. Uh, you know, plug your stuff. You know, where can we yeah. find you at to try to catch up more on some market stuff? I know, like you said, you put out daily podcasts. So you, there's a lot more information that you're putting out there about this team. Where can we find you? Yeah, absolutely. So tapping the keg on X slash Twitter, tapping keg sports on Instagram, as well as TikTok and Facebook. I, I do these reviews where I'm probably way too unhinged for my middle thirties, but that's okay. Um, we, uh, we have fun with it and we do talk a lot of Marquette, but if you're into the Green Bay Packers, you're into the Milwaukee Brewers, the Milwaukee Bucks. We also talk about those two, those teams and big, uh, big buck Celtics game before, uh, before we get started with March Madness on Wednesday night, which will be, uh, covering heavily on Thursday. So, uh, thank you for, uh, having me on and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see some, see some crossover, uh, here soon enough and, uh, have a couple, couple, uh, WKU, uh, ladies and gentlemen, join us, join us on the, uh, tapping the keg side too. Yeah, man, absolutely. It's been fun. Again, I, I appreciate you coming on giving us some knowledge and, Looking forward to this game, and you know, like you, I'm going to be pacing around, and and hopefully it's a good one. Best of luck to you. Yeah, great luck. Great, best of luck to you too, Stephen, and uh, have a good one. You too. Appreciate you. All right, bye. A lot of good information in there. You know, really appreciate Charlie um, taking the time to sit down and just talk a little Marquette basketball, give us some insight of what to expect and how their season went, and just um, just how tough a matchup this is going to be. I think anytime. You know, you got a 15 versus a two. That's that's an uphill battle. You know, we talked about that, just how everything almost has to go right, has to be perfect, maybe even a little luck. You know, we've got to continue playing, you know, the best basketball of our season. You know, this is the toughest opponent we have played all year. Um, and we're going to have to show up. The fans are going to have to show up. An easy drive to Indianapolis. I think it's about four hours-ish from Bowling Green. Um, you know, WK Sports and Athletics has – had our allotment of uh, tickets. We have sold that out. Uh, they were taking deposits up until four o'clock today on Monday, and they cut that off. Uh, so now all ticket sales are going to have to go through Ticketmaster. Um, but really looking forward to this game, this trip. It's going to be a tough one. You know, the ESPN Power Index only gives us a 5.6% chance of winning. So, Tyler, I've got to ask you, you know, how does this game you know, against Marquette, how does it feel to you? Well, I mean, I'm not real thrilled about that uh, that power index uh, chance of winning. Uh, but, I mean, I think the last few years, you know, we – the underdogs always have a shot, right? Like, if you would have went a few years back and told Leola Chicago that, hey, um, 
you know, I'm sure they saw their chance was probably less than 5%. I'm sure they said, all right, we'll take that. Um, I mean, I think this is going to be a very challenging game. Uh, and we have absolutely nothing to lose. So I think we need to go out there and play our toughest D, uh, take the smartest shots we can find, and and force the turnovers. Uh, and, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm, that's not my keys to victory, but – Maybe some of them could be. Um, I mean, this is going to be a test. And, you know, last year when Lutz, I think he was coaching against Alabama. I can't remember the score of that game. I know they lost. But, uh, you know, he took Texas A&M Corpus Christi and uh, and played them. And I, I think we're better than Texas A&M Corpus Christi. We definitely have more resources. And I, I just think we're a way better team. Um I think this game against Marquette, I know a lot of people were like, you know, this is a matchup we wanted. Um, I do wish we was seated a little higher. You know, I think 15 is kind of, kind of dis- not really disrespectful, but, I mean, that, that that's kind of crappy. Um, but we, we got to play the cards we're dealt. Um, I think this is, this is, this is going to be a test, and you're right. This is going to be uh, our team has to play a damn near perfect game. And I think they're going to try their best, and uh, and we'll see where the cards fall. Yeah, and, I would, you know, Charlie and I, we talked about some of the players that we need to know, but I wanted to, you know, do our normal thing. The, their leading players in every category. Uh, so, first off, their leading scorer is number one, Cam Jones. He's a six foot five junior guard. He's averaging 16.8 points per game. Their leading rebounder is number 13, Oso Igadaro, he's a six foot eleven senior. He's averaging six point nine rebounds per game, nice, and fourteen points per game. And then their leading passer is number eleven, Tyler Kolick. He's a six foot three senior guard, averaging seven point six assists per game. He also averages fifteen points per game as well as four point seven rebounds per game. Um, you know that guy is a kind of a Swiss Army knife, does it all. He's coming back from an oblique injury. I think he hasn't played their last couple few games, uh, including that Big East tournament. Um, but you can kind of see he he's kind of their Don McHenry. He's their straw. You know, I would call him he stirs that drink. You know, over seven assists per game, 15 points per game, almost five rebounds per game. He does it all. Um, and getting him back healthy will be um, very good for them, bad for us. He's obviously going to be someone we have to be aware of, we have to contain. Um, and he can do it all over the court. You know, he's he's a solid player. Uh, also, one to be aware of and talk about number twenty three, David Joplin. He's a six foot eight junior forward that can absolutely fill it up from three. We can't let him get hot. You know, I know. You know, three point defense has kind of been an Achilles' heel for us all year. Um, you know, when teams get hot, they just seem to be wide open and just knock down all their shots. And one stat I found interesting talked about this. Um, in that interview, he was 0 for 6 in their last game versus UConn in that championship game from 3, 0 for 6. So I feel like he got his bad game out of his system. You know, we better be close. We better be nearby, face guarding him, hand up, not letting him get open because if he gets open and he gets hot, I have a feeling that the green light's going to be green and he's going to keep shooting. Um, he can fill it up. You know, just just check his box scores for the season. He's averaging over 10 points a game. Uh, 38% three-point shooter. Um, definitely have to be aware of him, and that's, you know, probably going to be a key to victory is containing that guy. So, Tyler, you know, hearing these stats and just knowing a little bit about this team, you know, what are you expecting from this Marquette team in this matchup? Well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm hoping Cam Jones, Tyler Kolick, and uh, Azo, I ain't even going to try to pronounce that, have their worst games of their season. Uh, you know, Shock is smart. He's a he, he's a good coach. You know, been been around a few a, a lot of teams, um, and I <clears throat> I would like for him to kind of overlook us, kind of not think none about it. I doubt he is because this is the NCAA tournament, and like Coach Lutz said, every team is good to be in the NCAA tournament. Um, I just feel like they're going to try to play their game and try to dominate us because uh, we are the underdog. I mean, I mean they they finished second in Big East behind 
you know, second to UConn, which is number one ranked team in the nation. Um, so I feel like they're going to try to force their will on us, and we just had to stand tough, uh, defend like no like no other. Uh, hopefully, defend like we did against the MTSU, and uh, definitely play great three point defense because I feel like this team. Uh, let's see, they have shot three hundred one. No, they made three hundred one uh, threes on the season, and they've attempted eight hundred forty. So I mean, that's good for thirty five and. 0.8 percent from three-point land um you know free throw percentage are only 71.5 and field goals at 47.8 so maybe we'll get them on one of their bad shoot nights i mean we got our whole team got their bad shoot night out against uh utep i mean three for that was three for 15 um i mean that's that's i think that may be our lowest percentage behind the wichita state game on the season. So hopefully we got that out of our system, got that out of our blood and uh, we'll be ready to start draining them here on Friday. Yeah. Now let's jump into some keys to victory. You know, what's your first key? What do we have to do to pull off this upset? Protect, protect the ball. I mean, we, we had, I think 16 turnovers uh, against UTEP and this whole season, that's been one of our Achilles heel. Um, I think there's only one or two games that we had below 10 turnovers. Um, it's, it, it, it ain't many. Uh, most time we have 17, 18, you know, 19. You know, uh, we definitely need to limit that to hopefully single digits because Marquette, uh, they are averaging on the season 9.9 turnovers. Uh, so we definitely need to protect the ball because every possession we get is going to be to our benefit, especially if it ends up – I mean, it, it, it has to end up in points. Uh, either free throw, layup, you know, or, or three-pointer. Uh, it, it's going to have to end in, end in points, or I fear we're going to get behind in this one. Yeah, my number one key is also protect the ball. We can't turn it over a ton. Again, we, we don't share notes. You know, I don't – you don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what you're saying, but – um, the turnovers is definitely going to be a factor. You know, Shaka Smart, you know, since his days at VCU, has been known to play an aggressive uh, 40 minutes of havoc, 94 feet of hell style defense that is going to blitz you and trap you and pressure you the entire game. Um, they are number 26 in the country, I believe it is, in turnovers fourth per game. They are number six in the nation in turnover margin, uh, over four uh, turnovers better per game than their opponent. So um, they're aggressive on the defensive end of the ball. And we, uh, like you said, that can be our Achilles heel. Um, bad three-point defense and then a lot of turnovers. We're just giving the ball right back to them, uh, letting them go down for a quick score. Um, it's going to be a long, long day. And, you know, and that 14 to 16 point spread could get a lot bigger, a lot quicker so we've got to protect the ball, um, give ourselves a chance, and be efficient with us. Um, but that's definitely the first key, and, and I think it's not a coincidence that it is for both of us. It's probably one of the most important keys. Uh, what's your second key to victory? See, I, I don't, I don't want to say it, but it probably needs to be said play hard ass defense uh, because like what you just said uh shock smart he's known for that aggressive type of defense and uh, you know if if we're giving up three point shots like we did against la tech at home or we're I, mean, I can't remember which game it was but i mean someone just drove the basket got past our guy no one either no one even slid over tried to help um i think it was an away game but we, we we can't do that. Uh, you got to try to stop the ball, get some steals, force some t- 